I'm here at LuxCon with artist Donato Giancola. Uh, thank you for speaking with me. All right, you're welcome, Chris. Um, I'd like to start by asking, is there an artwork here you're most proud of and why? Oh, wow. Oh, you know, there's a couple, actually. I, I don't have favorites. I have, I, I have two children, so I learned uh, not to have uh, any favorites mm -hmm. in that way. But there's themes that I have. And okay. certainly pieces come out, arise out of those. Mm -hmm. And I, I just had a piece here of a uh, uh, empathetic robot, so oh, okay. that I, a series that I'm executing. Oh, okay. And it uh, looks like a mother embracing a small child-like robot. Okay. Uh, and it's actually a painting of an android embracing another robot. Hmm. Uh, it's a, the title of the book is uh, called More Human Than Human. Okay. And so I was attempting to convey a very human attachment or the projection of human emotion mm -hmm. into objects that we normally perceive as not having human emotions and right. so the uh, the mother character was actually rendered like a human mm -hmm. but one of her irises has a little square and so it's, it shows that yeah. she's not quite human yeah. but your initial read of the image is that it's a, a human embracing a robot yeah uh, and so that so that was one of my favorites uh, okay. here on the walls today oh, okay okay um, how do you know when a work is finished? The deadline ah. arises. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, you know, that's part of it. That's a joke. But it, it is true. I, uh, almost my entire career has been built around commercial co commercial commissions, mm -hmm. uh, delivering book covers, trading cards, okay. uh, even private commissions that I kind of give a deadline for mm -hmm. so that I'm very conscious of attempt wanting to meet the deadline, uh, re meet my clients expectations mm -hmm. and therefore I've learned to just commit to the decisions mm -hmm. that I make along the process mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes you know I go a little over deadline okay. but with my commercial work is almost my entire career has been about meeting that day mm -hmm. uh, or that week that the expected image is to be delivered mm -hmm. and that's uh, so I've, I've built my work model my work is ethic around delivering projects on time for my clients. Okay. Right. Um, what inspires you? Wow. Oh, life. Uh, just getting out, walking the streets in New York, uh, living with my family, and seeing other projections of live, I mean, photography, uh, news, media. So even though I execute a lot of science fiction and fantasy, right. uh, I attempt to project some of our modern problem modern issues into my work okay. uh, it doesn't always float on the surface very evidently okay. but it certainly is an undercurrent in what I do as an artist uh, so much of the uh, kind of the trauma uh, ideas of immigration are very subtly brought into some of my work as well okay yeah. okay is that so? The piece you described, um, your favorite piece, is that what inspired that? Is it? Oh wow! Uh, the, uh, those are. Uh, I've been working on a series of I call them empathetic robots, and it's about basically sh showing uh, you know humans showing empathy for each other, uh, mm. like caring for strangers, mm. uh, caring for. Uh, I mean, uh, this world is getting more and more populous. I mean, we're you end up you know we're getting to see greater integration, greater merging of different kinds of cultures. Right. And I think it's important that, you know, especially, you know, America as a kind of a first world country yeah. leads the way in how we respect and respect other individuals, how we respect people who are less well off than us in our, in our culture. I mean, we're, nearly everyone in America doesn't have to worry about food. I mean, we have, obviously we have some hunger issues in the States, but those are more political. I mean, food is so inexpensive and cheap here. Yeah. Uh, yet, you know, the rest, so many places in the rest of the world, people are starving. So the idea that, you know, caring for, you know, we are, you know, we should be part of the world's caretaker when it comes to just providing basic necessity, right. basic ideas of treatment and health care rights towards individuals and recognizing just because you're born in another country doesn't mean that you're you're not human you're not you know you're not an American citizen but that doesn't mean you don't have the rights of free speech and liberties that really our, our constitution represents so all of those so the, so the idea so that's these are all things that are you know and in the other current and then I project these feelings into these ideas of empathetic robots so the robots for me are a stand-in 
for humanity in general, like how we need to treat nature, how we need to treat each other. Mm. And then I structure the images to reflect these principles that I have about my, my own thoughts about humanity and the way I want even my children to grow up looking at other people. Right. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. What is your most important artist tool? Is there something you can't live without in your studio? <laughs> It'd have to be a pencil. Uh, you know, outside of anything else I do with painting, with color, the primary thing that I do as an artist, the primary motivator, is the idea of expression through line, mm -hmm. expression through contour and what I can do with a pencil. Mm -hmm. So if you had to take everything, anything out, you know, everything else out of my studio yeah. and leave me with something, yeah. it would be a pencil. Okay. Because uh, you know you can draw, you can draw on the floor, you can draw on the wall, mm -hmm. uh, and it's the, that it's. I mean, it's one of the probably the most primitive forms of tool structure for making art that we have, you know, that's recorded in history, right? right? These little nubs of pigment that they find in the pits. Yeah. Uh, you know, a, a basic charcoal branch thrown into the fire, a branch charcoaled and burnt in a fire yeah. becomes a pencil. Yeah. And imagine those were like the first things that implements that we use to draw. So that's, for me, that is the most important tool for okay. me to execute my work. Okay. All right. Is there an element of art you enjoy working with most and why? Either medium, process. Yeah, but let's see. Wow. Oh. I, now again, it kind of comes back to the drawing, mm -hmm. I think. Okay. What? Because drawing is, for me, a very much a way of exploring. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't actually explore and paint like other artists do. Other artists do initiate the creative process in color and value when they paint. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it actually starts in the drawing process. Okay. So when I sketch in my book, uh, sketch in my, my, my small you know, notebook or, or, or sketchbook, that, that's where I'm truly investigating potential ideas and ways of telling, telling story. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a critical part of what I do is it's in that, it's in the drawing phase of those initial bits of ex exploration in my sketchbook. Okay. All right. Um, how did you start making art and why do you make art? I can't remember when I started making art. Uh, I, I jokingly state that I must have left uh, cave paintings in my mother's womb because for, for my younger brother to see you know, when he came through because uh, I, I mean, seriously like my parents have drawings from when I was in first grade and I'm not talking like one or two drawings they have a little portfolio of drawings that I made in my first grade class that the teacher handed to my parents to keep at the end of the year and luckily I still have those so that I mean so I must have been drawing everywhere all the time you know, in my free time or so so that again that goes back to what I love doing like drawing uh, is a foundation of me as a, as a painter now uh, is that act of creative expression through line uh, so that's that's you know that's where it all started and basically but I didn't start actually considering myself a professional until I took my very first art classes which were, I was 20 years old. Okay. So my entire life uh, up until that point was being a hobby artist, a okay. fan artist, oh, okay, uh, right. drawing D&D maps, yeah. uh, oh, drawing okay. superhero characters, right? Yeah. Yeah, oh. So you're laughing, yeah, it's yeah. like, yeah, probably everyone, everyone did that, right, as a kid. <laughs> but you know, I, so I just carried that through my teen years, and, and, but it was all fan art, uh, D and drawing D&D you know, images and characters, science fiction characters, drawing, you know, emulating the concept art from Empire Strikes Back yeah. and, uh, and making models and planes. So I actually had other creative outputs other than drawing. Okay. Uh, so I used to make a lot of things, make toys, yeah. manufacture my own armor, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, I made, made like riveted steel plates to make a suit of armor oh, wow. uh, as well. But 
it wasn't until that, those first art classes in college that I took that I began to realize that I could maybe consider this as a profession, okay. as a potential career path. Yeah. And at that point, that's when I started enrolling and changed colleges to attend an art institution. Mm -hmm. And that's when I really began the formative study uh, years of learning how I could better myself as an artist. Okay. Um, and that's when I became a, a student, uh, so to speak. You know, moving away from just being a fan and drawing whatever I wanted, I changed my attitude towards the art, whether that I was making, and I became a sponge. I was willing to look at other artists, other artist styles, styles I didn't even really like, but I wanted to absorb and understand why they were making their choices they yeah. did. And that was heavily, in, all of that, you know, kind of came into me, and then I outwardly put that into my own personal work. And I never left science fiction and fantasy, and so uh, it was always there, always you know, an another uh, form of art that I was making at the time. Oh, okay. Do you recall, uh, just thinking back to that, when you were a kid, that first portfolio, do you remember what themes you were exploring? Oh, it was, most, you know, it, was, it was mostly, the, the reason why they have it, it was mostly projects from the books I was reading. Oh, okay. Um, and so the teacher, most, most of the other students in the class would have to do grammar, Structured, uh, like you know, conjugate all the verbs in the book, or uh, or answer questions about characters. But my teacher, knowing how much I love to draw, would say, "Draw me a picture of what happened on page 37," oh. uh, and I'd reinterpret that 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 story. Okay. So almost all of those drawings are actually drawings of children's books oh, wow. out of them. And yeah, so it's uh, so what I really have is a reflection of the. The books I was reading as a young boy. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what's there. So I didn't have any of the imaginative stuff. I didn't have fantasy. And then science, that was just not there. It was oh. only through, seen through the eyes of the children's book illustrators. Huh. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Um, what role, and you've addressed some of this already, but what role does the artist have in society? Well, like I mentioned, I, I, I believe uh, as... As a commercial artist where my work reaches millions of people, I, I take it as a little bit of a social responsibility to convey what I believe in, my, my ethics, uh, because I know that my work will be seen, potentially seen, by hundreds of thousands and millions of people, uh, and also worldwide, uh, especially through the art of magic, the gathering, some of those trading cards. That those audiences reach uh, tens of millions of of, of people worldwide. Mm -hmm. So when I'm thinking about what kind of character, what kind of relationship these characters exhibit to one another inside the art, I'm very conscious of projecting my moral values into them. You know, not knocking people over the head, but just subtle things that I do. You know, kind of uh, the equality of women, uh, the treatment of you know individuals, of ideas of conflict, mm -hmm. like the conflict resolution. You know, not all, you know, conflict doesn't have to be about battle. It can be about ideas, right? And coming to uh, an understanding between two sides. Right. So, you know, an understanding doesn't always mean that you have to kill the other person, right? It means that you have to learn how to live with their ideas. Yeah. Uh, and so that's something that I feel is important to convey. Okay. All right. Uh, what movies, books, or other artwork in science fiction or fantasy have inspired you? Wow, a lot of, a lot of that. I mean, I, being a young artist, young man growing up in the 80s, there's a lot of great material that came out of that. Yeah. Uh, and also, I, I love literature. Uh, so I love like Ursula K. Le Guin, uh, some of her novels. Right. Uh, and it was for movies, obviously. Star Wars was very instrumental in moving me. Uh, but even other films like Aliens, uh, Blade Runner, uh, certainly those are very moving, uh, both visually and narratively, uh, but very fascinating stories. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of inspiration. I don't just pick one. I don't have one favorite that I point to. Uh, I consumed a lot of movies, uh, consumed a lot of, of books. I mean, I was an avid reader, uh, almost like a, almost a book a week. I think I was going through on, uh, uh, with with novels, yeah, uh, the science fiction, fantasy novels. Oh yeah. So yeah. So there's a, I mean, I can't you know, so many names. Uh, Back then, you know, including like big names like you know, Ray Bradbury, right. uh, Arthur C. Clarke, yeah. uh, and then either people, you know, other people like you know, David Drake was another fit. Uh, and then even having fun with like uh, Piers Anthony okay. uh, and the Xanth novels, very playful stuff. So I, you know, I took, I consumed both kind of serious 
uh, political things like with Ursula K. Le Guin and us, also like lighthearted uh, adventure with with like things like Piers Anthony or uh, you know obviously Tolkien was a massive influence with Dungeons and Dragons and such. Yeah. So I would be remiss not mentioning him yeah. uh, as well. Do you recall Tales of the Vulgar Unicorn? I believe it was. Whoa, no, I don't. Well, that was at a Piers Anthony. Or? No, that was from the '80s. It was an anthology. Different writers would do stories based on this this particular world, this city. Oh no, oh, not, yeah, that one doesn't ring a bell. Yeah, they did about ten books, I think. I think Tales was the first one. Okay, but that was the one I enjoyed. I'm just, you know, when you listed the, the various ones, it popped in my head. Oh, all right. So, yeah, it's uh, yeah. So, no, there's yeah. So I, again, I was, I was a member of the science fiction book club for years. So I would just you know, you'd be forced to buy a bunch of novels, uh, oh, yeah. you know, to re retain your membership. So yeah. just yeah, consuming lots and lots of novels that way. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there an art piece you'd like to create that you haven't done so yet, and what is it? Well, I've got quite a few projects. I have more. I have a, a little wall next to my drafting table of sketches of very small ideas. It's my kind of concept wall, and it's filled with at least 50 to 60 concepts of paintings I want to do, want to execute. Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot there, and, and those include images from Middle Earth, uh, I have another at least three to four robots already, uh, empathetic robots in mind for that, and then I still have ongoing projects. But mostly, there there are the the empathetic robot series has become something I really am embracing uh, and wanting to run with because it matches more my uh, aesthetics of moral aesthetics that I have, and I'm able to project that without having to deal with a marketing director or a client's uh, imposition of their ideas. So these are all purely images that are personally motivated for me. So those are the ones I'm most eager to, to jump, jump into right now. Okay. And since you mentioned uh, working with clients, um, if, if they do, how, how do you handle the situation when they say they want to change certain elements? Or they almost never do. Uh, I'm very good at communicating with my clients. I'm very good at involving them in a creative process. So I provide a very detailed drawing, uh, two steps, a very detailed, fairly detailed rough idea of the concept. Right. And then after I've generated all of my reference gathering, my detail, I then even submit them with a final preliminary drawing of what I'm going to do in the final, the oil painting. Okay. And sometimes there's some modifications in that, but mostly they're excited to be involved in seeing the development of the piece. Okay. And I have almost very, I mean, yes, there's, there's some minor tweaks like, you know, just like, can you move like a little staff here? And I do that usually digitally. Or can you add a little color in this area? There's such minor tweaks that they, they don't... In, uh, reflect any kind of major, any kind of change in the work at all. Okay. Uh, so it's very, so in part of that aspect of being, again, meeting my clients' demands, working with them, I keep them happy, and therefore I don't deal with hardly any modifications in my work. Okay. All right. Um, that's all the questions I have. That's it, Chris? You, okay. Do you have anything to add? or? No, uh, I think that's, uh, you know, I just would like to stay you off here. If you're an artist, uh, really think about how your audience, what your audience is, you know, yeah. who you want to, what you want to say with your work. You know, your work doesn't, even when you're working for a commercial commission for a client, mm -hmm. you're executing a novel illustration. Mm -hmm. You know, you can get your own ideas in there. You can project some of your own emotions and feelings, your perception of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, weave that into some of the work so that you become personally attached very personal detached to what you're executing mm -hmm. and that way you own it yourself you feel connected to it and then you're also pr more proud of that image when it's executed well and it's out there in the public yeah. that's, cool. that's my recommendation cool all right Chris. Well, thank you all right you're welcome please visit chrisalvarez.com for more cool stuff that's c-r-i-s-a-l-v-a-r-e-z.com Thanks for listening and keep imagining the future.